By November of 1860, the economic and political differences between the North and South came to a head with the election of the Northern sectional candidate, Abraham Lincoln. Soon after the election, many Southern states began to secede from the Union, and on January 26, 1861, Louisiana became the sixth Southern state to formally secede. For the next few months, an uneasy peace prevailed as Louisiana struggled to prepare for the expected war to follow. Finally, with the firing on Fort Sumter by Confederates at Charleston, South Carolina, President Abraham Lincoln took action, and a call was made for 75,000 volunteers to help suppress the Southern Rebellion. In turn, President Jefferson Davis of the newly formed Confederate States of America issued the call for troops from every southern state to defend her borders. The South saw the presence of northern troops as an invasion on their soil and helped stimulate the populace into action. Louisiana had begun the active preparation for war, a war that most all thought would culminate in one large battle that would decide the issue. All over Louisiana, civic leaders began organizing companies of volunteers to serve, they held meetings, barbecues, and rallies to help organize and encourage the young sons of Louisiana to enlist in the Confederate Army. Louisiana needed a place to organize and train these men into disciplined fighting units well prepared for battle. The first place chosen was named Camp Walker, and it was located at the Metairie Racecourse, the present-day site of the Metairie Cemetery. This lasted only a few weeks, as Camp Walker was not convenient to a good water supply and was too convenient to the temptations offered by the proximity to New Orleans. A group of men from the soon to be formed 4th Louisiana Regiment were sent to the Florida parishes to locate a new camp. A site was chosen in Upper St. Helena Parish near the railroad town of Tangipahoe. It was convenient to the Tangipahoe River and Beaver Creek for fresh water and was located on the railroad line headed north from New Orleans so troops could be moved in and out easily. Under the command of a militia officer, General Elisha L. Tracy, the new camp was named Camp Moore in honor of the sitting governor of Louisiana, Thomas Overton Moore. Companies were forming all over the state. A company would consist of 64 or more privates with a cadre of officers and non-commissioned officers. They would all be from a local area such as a single city, a group of towns, or perhaps an entire parish. It is important to remember that many of these men were fighting side by side with men they generally had grown up with and known all of their lives. When a company had the required number of men, they would submit their application for enlistment. The Confederate government made the call for troops to the Louisiana governor, and he, in turn, made the call to the state. The companies would then be allowed to come to Camp Moore. Camp Moore was there primarily as a camp of organization. That is, the companies were there to form a larger military unit, such as a battalion of four or more companies, or even a regiment of ten companies. This organizational process of forming companies to battalions and regiments could take only a few days or sometimes weeks. 
In the meantime, the citizen soldiers were always kept busy learning the skills and discipline of being good soldiers. Many of these men had never been away from home. Military training and discipline were new to these men. Some adapted well, others found it more difficult. We were fairly initiated into the mysteries and miseries of a soldier's life. Henry Henderson, July 1861. Once a group of 10 companies had decided to align into a regiment, the men voted for their officers. And typically, within a few days, the regiment of about a thousand men would move out by rail to points north, such as Virginia or Tennessee, or sometimes south to the Gulf Coast. The general layout of Camp Moore is further described in soldiers' letters. The camp is a rather vast and offers a fine parade ground. It's an elevated place, which means that despite the daily rains, we have no mud. We're one mile east of the town of Tangipaho and a half a mile west of the river of the same name. General Tracy is the commandant of the camp. There are about 1,000 to 1,200 soldiers here. On our western boundary of the camp are found some restaurants and shops and a fine canteen. Thomas Bellow, September 1861. On the left are to be seen the buildings of the quartermaster and commissary departments, the tents of headquarters, the sutler's sheds, the little booths of stores and refreshments, the guard house, a log cabin covered in evergreens, and the shanty of an enterprising ambertype artist who furnishes handsome warriors with their counterfeit presentments. New Orleans B, May 1861. It was at Camp Moore that many of these citizen soldiers got their first taste of military discipline. Reveille at daylight, then company drill for an hour or so, a non-commissioned drill at six, breakfast at seven, and guard mounting at eight. The duties connected with the guard are the most arduous of the camp. Those who are detailed for guard are on duty 24 hours, being on duty two and off four. 250 men are constantly on guard duty around the camp. John Austin, May 1861. The regulations of the camp are very stringent. We cannot turn a corner after 9 o'clock at night without feeling the point of a bayonet about our ribs. In daytime, none of us can go to town without a pass signed by our captain and countersigned by the officer of the day. I suppose it is highly important that such rigid regulations should be observed in order to secure peace and harmony on the campgrounds. The Opelousas Patriot, June 1861. Also at the camp were several sutlers, or people that supplied goods to the soldiers that the state or army did not provide. In spite of all the drill and military atmosphere, men still found time to enjoy life here. Since our diet is of a uniformity and monotony that hardly stimulates the appetite, we often go to auntie's for diversion. Auntie is the round and powerful hostess of our most popular restaurant in Camp Moore. Thomas Bellow, September 1861. Provisions are mighty scarce, none for breakfast. Those who have no money have to go dry. Amos Amsel, June 1861. Our breakfast consists of some species of dried sausage, fried ham, and tolerably good coffee. Our dinner the same and supper the same, minus the ham and sausage, all of which generally disappears at dinner. Lawrence Nichols, June 1861. Times are a little better than they have been. We have pickled pork, beef, beans, some cornbread and crackers at this time, which is a treat indeed. John Guerin, June 1861. We have a merry campground. Fun, sparring matches, and good singing are the order of the day and night. Each man seems disposed to adapt himself to camp usages with the least possible difficulty. And no doubt, should they be so fortunate as to encounter the enemy, will give a good account of themselves. John Austin, May 1861. In spite of the rigors of camp life, these men learned to adapt, and many had stories to send home of their new adventures at Camp Moore on the way to war. The impressions of life at Camp Moore were as varied as the men who came through here. At first, some of the boys were rather dissatisfied with the condition of things in camp. The idea of washing shirts and ironing them with a brick bat, grinding coffee, and washing dishes was rather undesirable, but actual necessity has taught them not to flinch from any duty, no matter how unpleasant it may be, and all are perfectly reconciled 
to do whatever may devolve upon them. Aristide Guillory, June 1861. Was you ever at Camp Moore? It is a beautiful place. The place up at camp is about 50 acres of level pine land, surrounded by beautiful streams of water, as clear as it can be, and as cold as water ever gets to be. Anybody to look at this place would say, in an instant, this is a healthy place. John Marler, September 1861. The camp is one of the filthiest places I have ever been permitted to see. There are more flies in and around Camp Moore than there are in all of Bienville Parish. Reuben Pearson, June 1861. There is so much profanity there that I cannot enjoy myself. John Gann, June 1861. Estimates range from as low as a few hundred to as high as 5,000 men at Camp Moore at various times. Ultimately, with this many people crowded together, sickness was inevitable. At Camp Moore, there were two bad measles outbreaks, which in those days was life-threatening. Serious complications, such as pneumonia, chronic diarrhea, and typhoid fever left many men stricken. Many good young men died that never faced a blue-coated enemy, but that did not make their sacrifice any less heroic. Isaac Hart wrote to his parents in October 1861, A young man's trouble is nothing here if he can have his health. Two weeks later, Isaac's brother would write this letter home about Isaac. Dear mother, I drop a few lines with regret. I have to say to you in pain that that brother is no more. He died this morning of typhoid pneumonia. He was taken the 12th of this month. He had a chill when taken and he suffered with a pain in his breast and side. He got very near clear of the pain but seemed restless. He had all the attention the camp could afford. A very good doctor attended him. He was willing to die in his last moments. Thomas Harp, October 1861. We have some sickness in camp. Every two or three days, a procession files by with slow measured tread, muffled drums and reversed arms, which tell that some fellow, brave and noble perhaps, has gone to his long home, E. John Ellis, October 1861. Camp Moore flourished in supplying soldiers to the Confederacy from May 1861 until the late summer of 1862, when most of the men that were going to volunteer had done so. After that, Camp Moore was turned into a conscription camp for those men pressed or drafted into the service. It also served as a gathering point for various actions in southeast Louisiana, such as the attack on federal-occupied Baton Rouge in August 1862. Confederate troops moved in and out of Camp Moore on various missions throughout 1863. By 1864, Camp Moore was only a shell of its former use. It was overrun by federal cavalry in October and November of that year, and everything of value was burned. Camp Moore ceased to exist. 35 years passed after the end of the war, and the people were busy rebuilding their lives. Nature reclaimed Camp Moore. By 1900, various patriotic organizations had formed, such as the United Confederate Veterans, United Daughters of the Confederacy, and Sons of Confederate Veterans. It was from these groups that the movement to reclaim Camp Moore began. The cemetery property was secured, a fence and monument built, and for 60 years these groups stood watch over the grounds. Additional land was secured in the 1960s, and a museum built which still stands. Today Camp Moore is run by a nonprofit organization composed of members of these organizations and other interested individuals. It is staffed today by volunteers. It was volunteers that came through Camp Moore on the way to war. It is our object to see Camp Moore remain open to the public so that the proud story of the sons of Louisiana may be told to future generations and that the burial place of these brave men should be kept sacred. The mission of the Camp Moore Historical Association can be best summed up in the words of a soldier that came through here in late 1864 and wrote these words to his wife. We stopped here at Camp Moore, where we were all trained. 
to rest a few days. It made us mad to see the place. The Yankees had destroyed about everything. They even knocked over the cemetery markers, so families can't tell where their kin are buried now. John Wilkerson said, that is the fate of soldiers, buried and forgotten. A lot of good men died here at Camp Moore, a lot of my friends. I sure will never forget them. And Sarah, if I don't get home, make sure the kids remember. Who knows, I might get buried in some far off place where you could never find me. Always remember a part of me and the whole Southern cause is here at Camp Moore. We can't ever forget them. As you walk her grounds, it is easy to let the mind wander, and you can almost hear the sounds of men marching, orders being barked, and the rumble of horses moving across the fields. One can imagine the sounds around the campfire, the laughter, the telling of stories, the sound of the fiddle, banjo, or harmonica. It is easy to visualize a dozen of smoke streams so lazily lifting skyward from dew-covered ground on an early morning as the smell of coffee and bacon over open fires arouse still another sense. You might be able to picture a tent with friends comforting a sick and dying friend. Stopping under one of the large trees, you might picture a young man writing a letter home to his wife or mother. Try to imagine a steam engine puffing to a halt, and hundreds of young men disgorging from the crowded flat cars and coaches to the cheers of hundreds of their fellow Louisianians cheering the new arrivals that would join them on their quest. Camp Moore is historically correct. Nothing more, nothing less. Help us ensure the truth of tomorrow by preserving our past today. <laughs>